Happy Easter, everybody. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. And we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday today. So happy Resurrection Sunday. Our message today is entitled, The High Price That Jesus Paid. I want you to turn with me, please, to our scripture found in Mark chapter 15, verse 33 through 39. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And some ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. It is now three o'clock in the afternoon and Jesus has just died. Jesus has just breathed his last. He has yielded up his spirit to the Father. And he is now dead. And by now, he has probably been awake some 34 to 36 hours. So his body is weary and tired. Jesus was always an early riser. He would capitalize on the quietness and the cool of the morning to seek the face of his Father in prayer. And that previous morning, the morning before his arrest, of all mornings, that morning would have been no different. If you study this, the, the gospel, it is a well-known fact that the first thing Jesus did every single day was to wake up very early every single morning of every single day to seek the face of his heavenly Father. And so, it would be nothing to doubt that he had gotten up even earlier than usual since that day would have been the last full day he would spend alive. And he knew it. I mean, he spent the last night before he was arrested in prayer. So why not? Why not get up even earlier to pray? Because when he was praying that night before his arrest, this was his prayer. Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Your will be done, Heavenly Father. For it is your will that I have come to perform. It's your will that I have come to do. This was his agonizing prayer for deliverance from what was to come. Yet there was no other way for you or for me, for your family or for my family to have eternal life, but for Jesus to go through what it was that he went through. Jesus purchased us with his very own blood. His life for our life. I want to back up in time to the point of Jesus' arrest. He had eaten the Passover meal with his disciples. We refer to it as the Last Supper. So at the Last Supper, Jesus institutes our Christian ordinance of communion, which we call the Lord's Supper. Incidentally, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he institutes baptism. At the end of his ministry, he institutes communion. The two ordinances that the Protestant church observes. Baptism and communion. I just thought I would throw that in for FYI. Anyway, at the Last Supper, Jesus institutes our Christian ordinance of communion. He said, 
in Mark chapter 14, verse 22 through 25. Take this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The new covenant of the blood of Jesus can be summed up in one verse, that one verse is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is no excuse for us to go to a place of eternal punishment. Jesus Christ paid for your salvation with his life, with his own life's blood. He paid for you. And he paid for me. We have eternal life in Jesus Christ if we turn from our sins and turn to him. But we have to turn. We have to turn away from the wickedness. We have to turn away from our iniquities. We have to make a change. That means that we need to repent. To repent is to think the opposite way. Repent is to go in the opposite direction. Do the opposite things that we used to do. We are to repent, to go in the opposite direction. And without a doubt, you must turn away from your sins and forsake your iniquities. I heard a very popular pastor tell his congregation this, and I want to quote this is what he said. He said, there will be many people today sitting in churches and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ who do not believe they're eternally secure. They believe that their conduct will determine whether they go to heaven or hell or not. And imagine what kind of insecurity that is. You go to church, you sing these wonderful hymns, and then somebody says to you, you're going to heaven? And you have to say, I hope so, maybe so, I think so. Sometimes I think I am, and sometimes I think I'm not. End of quote. That, sir, no offense to you, but that is a dangerous, dangerous theology. Our conduct has everything to do with whether or not we will inherit eternal life. I believe it was John Edwards who said it best. He said, the salvation that does not change me will not save me. That sums it up right there. If it is true salvation, it must change you. The Holy Spirit cannot come into your life without working or without making a change in your conduct. In the way that Jesus entered a house, every home that he entered, that life was eternally changed. Their conduct was eternally changed. Zacchaeus, that we all man, Zacchaeus is a prime, prime example. He said, no longer will I do the things that I used to. If I cheated, I will cheat no more. A change must come. Conduct must change. The whole theology of what that preacher was preaching is wrong on several, several points. First of all, the scripture does not teach that we will inherit eternity in heaven or spend eternity in heaven and that's why they we're there for the marriage supper of the lamb and then we come back to earth because it is the meek that will inherit the earth not the non-believers but we're not even going to address that then what do we do is the question i want to ask what do we do with what Jesus said that very night that he was betrayed? John chapter 15, verse 1 through 8. I want to go through this. I want to dissect 
what Jesus was saying. This was his last, last message to his disciples, to the apostles, to those who had faithfully followed him for three and a half years. Everything that he had taught them was stored up in this one message. And this is what he said. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. First of all, Jesus tells us very plainly, every branch in him. He is not referring to unbelievers, but to those who believe and have accepted him as Lord and as Savior. Those are the branches that have been grafted into him. You cannot deny that statement. Now, look at what he says next. Those branches who do not bear fruit will be taken away. Jesus did not skin up. He did not make it obscure. He said, those branches who are not bearing fruit, those branches who are in me, but they're not bearing fruit, they're useless branches, so they will be taken away. The branches that are not in him are not believers, are unbelievers. Those are not Believers is the unbelievers. So unbelievers do not need to be taken away. Unbelievers do not need to be removed because they were never there to begin with. He is talking to believers, those who will inherit eternal life. It is those branches that are in him who are not bearing fruit that will be taken away. The branches that does bear fruit, the Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, will prune. Now, pay attention to what Jesus says next in verse 3. Already you are clean because of the word that have been spoken to you. Verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus said that they were already clean, confirming that the branches that were in him are the Christian believers, those who had heard the message, those who had accepted the message, and those who have now come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now watch this. Abide in me, he says, Abide in me and I in you. You cannot abide in a place unless you are first in that place. If I am at home and my wife is at the mall and I call her and I say to her, I'm coming, abide there until I come. Where would I go to meet her? Certainly not in her bedroom. Certainly not at work or at her office. Well. Why not? Why not there? Because she is not there. Therefore, she cannot abide there. She first has to be there before she can abide. So she must abide where she is at the mall because that is where she's at. And that is where I will have to go to meet her. You cannot abide where, there, where you are not present at. It's just not possible. You're not omnipotent. Why must we abide in the vine? Because if we do not abide in the vine, we cannot bear fruit. And if we do not bear fruit, then we will be taken away. What happens when you're taken away? You gather up and you're burned. You're thrown into the fire. And that's not what we want. Look at verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, 
ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. There is no getting around that. There's no getting away from that. You must abide, and you can't abide unless you are first there. You must first be there. Then you must abide in order to bear fruit. fruit. But someone will ask, how do we abide? Well, that's a very good question. First, Jesus says that his words must be in you or abide in you. Look at, at John chapter 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You must keep his commandments. Think about that. You must keep his commandments. That has everything to do with your conduct. And don't even begin to entertain the thought that if you backslide, then you weren't truly saved in the first place. Judas was truly saved. Jesus did not say that they are all clean because of the word that I have spoken to them, except for you, you Judas. Look at what Peter said. This is what Peter said concerning Judas. Acts chapter 1, verse 24 through 25. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas Turn aside to go to his own place. Peter did not believe that Judas was not saved to begin with. He believed he was and even had a prominent place in that ministry if he had continued, if he had changed his conduct. But his conduct prevented him from continuing in that capacity. He could not function in the capacity because he did not change his conduct. Therefore, sir, your conduct has everything to do with your salvation. If you're living the way Jesus instructed you to live, and if you're doing what it is that Jesus commanded you to do, then you have eternal security. But if you stop bearing fruit, make no mistake, then you will be cut off. You will be thrown away. You will be cast into the fire and burnt up. Why would Jesus go through all of that pain? Think about that. All of the pain and the torture and the suffering just for you to continue to live the way that you want any or how and he went through all of that pain and that suffering and you have nothing to do with it. Your conduct don't even matter. I believe it's an insult to the Lord to say that our conduct has nothing to do with our salvation. Nothing at all. Come on now, sir. Come on. Do better than that. Let us think about the price of our salvation. I want you to think about this. Consider this. Consider the price that Jesus paid for our salvation. Jesus has spent the night in deep, agonizing prayer. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We covered why Dr. Luke would put in sweat becoming blood in our, our message last year. It is a medical phenomenon. And Luke, Dr. Luke, being a doctor, understood the tremendous stress that Jesus would have been under. And he felt the need to record that, that one, one piece in his account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
So Judas shows up with a crowd of men, including the temple guards, to arrest Jesus. They take Jesus to the high priest's house, where Peter denies him three times. Peter said, I would even die for you, Lord. He said, really? Really? Would you really die for me, Peter? Tonight, you gotta, you got to deny me three times before the rooster crows. While Peter is denying him, and the crowd is jeering at him, and his disciples are all deserting him, the man holding Jesus in custody is mocking him and beating him. They even spit on the Son of God. They blindfold him, punch him, then mockingly ask, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they say all manner of evil things, all manner of things against him, and they blaspheme him in every way. After their mocking trial, they found Jesus guilty on false charges, trumped up charges. And they drag him to Pilate to be sentenced to death. Pilate did not find any guilt in him. So he hauls him off to Herod. Herod and his men now, it's their turn to mock Jesus. It's their turn now to treat Jesus contemptuously. Then they dress him in splendid clothes and just to mock him. And they send him back. To Pilate. Pilate still could not find any fault in him. Neither could Herod find any fault in him. And so Pilate sought to set him free. But the chief priests and the rulers had stirred up the people to demand that he be crucified. Jesus listened as the very ones that he came to see. His own people rejected him and shouted and called out, for his death. Crucify him. Crucify him. They yelled at the top of their lungs. Their faces filled with, 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 with rage. Their the hate in their voices. Anger in their voices. While Jesus went around their towns. Their cities only doing good. He was healing their sick. Curing leprosy. Making their blind see. Causing their deaf to hear. Their crippled walk. Even their dead was raised to life again. Jesus only did good in their towns and in their villages. And yet they screamed for his death. What does Pilate do since he could not release Jesus? Because the protest of the Jews. Well, for one, he released Barabbas in Jesus' place. Then he took Jesus and had him thoroughly scourged. They tell us that this scourge, which Horace called horrible flagellum, it consisted of a handle with several cords or leather thongs affixed to it. The thongs or cords, which were weighed with jagged pieces of bones or metal, made every blow more intense and more painful. The person was stretched out and tied to a post. Having their backs exposed, the executioner would plow into their body, striking again and again about their backs and their loins with their flagellum. The punishment was so horrible and so dreadful in its effects that the victim often fainted or even died under the terrible chastisement. By the end of the whipping, the merciless blows would have laid open wounds upon wounds. The person would be dripping in their own blood as exposed cuts would burn with pain, as the wounds would fill with the salt from their own sweat, causing even more pain and discomfort. Look at what Psalms 129 verse 3 says. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. 
This verse is a prophecy about the coming Messiah, Jesus the Christ. The plowers that plowed his back is referring to those who cruelly and viciously scourged him. The long furrows are deep and their brutal wounds upon his back that he was willing, he willingly endured to purchase our healing. Thus, by his stripes, you are healed. If anybody out there is sick in body right now, I command sickness to leave. That spirit of infirmity, I come against you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I say, be healed in the mighty and holy name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. For by his stripes, you are healed. It was a very high price to pay. So why would Jesus not grant you healing? Why would he keep that away from you when he paid such a high price for it? Surely the price that he paid for your healing would be wasted if he would not allow you to access it. Could it be that we are rendering it void and of no account if we do not receive the healing that he has purchased for us? If we say that, it's not his will to heal. It is Jesus' will to heal. Why would he pay for something he did not intend for you to have when it was such a high cost? After that vicious and brutal beating and the amount of blood loss, Pilate handed Jesus over to the mob to be crucified. Now it was the, the Roman soldiers' turn to mock Jesus and abuse him. For they gathered the whole battalion and stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted crown of thorns and jammed it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And they began to mock him. They began to spit on him. And they struck him on the head, pushing those thorns deeper and deeper into his head, deeper and deeper into his brow. They mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. This was not something lift uplifting. This was derogatory. They were making fun of him. Hail, King of the Jews. Three times Jesus was wickedly and maliciously mocked by the temple guards, by Herod and his men, and now by the Roman soldiers. After they grew tired of mocking and making a joke of Jesus, they put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now think about this for just a moment. Jesus was up all night praying and then was dragged from place to place, back and forth from the high priest to Pilate, from Pilate to Herod, from Herod back to Pilate again, an estimated two and a half miles, and by, and probably he had to jog, or at the least speed walk the majority of those miles. He was just beaten within inches of his life. His back is like raw meat. Now that they, now, now they throw a heavy cross on him, causing excruciating pain, running up and down his back, from his neck, all the way down the back of his legs to his ankle, and rushing back up again. Pain. With every step, splinters of raw wood from that heavy cross would dig deep into his open wounds. Jesus was mentally and physically exhausted. He had nothing else to give as they drove him and the two criminals towards the place of their execution. Fatigued from pure exhaustion, Jesus collapses under the weight of the heavy cross. So they grab one, Simon of Cyrene, and they command him to carry the cross for Jesus because he could not carry it another step. When they got to Golgotha's hill, they stretched him out again on that same cross he was forced to carry. 
And they drove nails into his hands. They drove nails into his feet. Nailing him to the cross and left him hanging there between heaven and earth. They left him to die. An innocent man, guilty of nothing, yet condemned to die. All he had done was to preach against sin, saying repent. Or in other words, change your conduct for the kingdom of God is at hand. He healed all of their sick and, all, and he drove out demonic spirits. They, he set them free. Those who were depressed, he set them free. They were harassed, he set them free. All he had done was good. He had loved them and they killed him. The innocent for the guilty, the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus paid a very, very high price for your salvation and for my salvation, for your family and for my family, to show how much he loves us and to show how much he cared about us. And then he turned around and he lavished all of that upon us as if it had no cost, as if it had cost him nothing. He just lavished salvation upon us. In that way, we have such a great reward in Jesus. So that is why I believe it is such a great sin to say we have no part. Our conduct means nothing. It's such a great tragedy to trample on the blood of Jesus. And we will have to answer if we trample on the blood of Jesus. For if we trample on the blood of Jesus, what is left for us? There is no salvation now left for us. We cannot treat the blood of Jesus as something common. Jesus paid a very, very high price for our salvation. And then to say that we have no part, I mean, we can do nothing, whatever, whatsoever. We, we, we have nothing to do. We can do whatever we want. We can live any way we want. We can say whatever we want because our conduct means nothing and still receive salvation. To me, it's almost blasphemous. To say that our conduct has nothing to do with our salvation, it's just another slap in Jesus' face. We say that, we spit on him again. Your conduct has everything to do with your salvation. I want to make one thing clear. I believe in eternal security. We don't have to worry about whether or not we're going to heaven. As long as we continue in Jesus, as long as we continue doing what it is that he instructed us to do, if we continue obeying his commandments, if we abide in his love and he in us, we have eternal security and we don't have to worry. Someone asks you, are you going to heaven? You can say with all assurance, yes, I am. Jesus paid the price for me. And now I am living for him. So let me ask you, would you like to have eternal security by accepting Jesus and continuing or abiding in him? Would you like to feel the peace that he purchased for us? with his own chastisement. Maybe you accepted Jesus a long time ago, but now you're living in a backslidden state. You have not been abiding. You have not changed your conduct. Jesus is coming back really, really soon. So your conduct is suggesting to you that you're not abiding in Jesus. Your conduct is suggesting to you that if Jesus comes back and finds you doing what it is that you're currently doing, you do not have eternal security. But you want to have eternal. You want to be sure. If that's you, I want you to say this prayer with me. 
Those of you who have never known Jesus before, have never accepted him as Lord and Savior, but you want to, you want to have that eternal security by abiding in Jesus. Say this prayer with me as well. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to abide in you. Help me to abide in your love and be obedient to your commandments. No matter what happens, no matter who say what, no matter what comes against me, help me, Lord Jesus, to abide in you. For I know that it's not those who start, but those who finish. I want to have that eternal security that Brother Kenny just preached about. Therefore, Lord Jesus, I accept your free gift of salvation today. Today, I accept you as Lord and Savior. I give you all of my sin. I give you all of my iniquities. Take it away from me, Lord, and create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me that I might continue in you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to find a Bible-believing church. Join that church. Be disciple in that church. A church that believes that Jesus is Lord. There's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. That Jesus said, abide in me, abide in my love, obey my commandments. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. Do the right thing. Make the right choices. Get yourself a Bible. Read your Bible every day. Highlight those verses that are meaningful. Commit them to memory. And I tell you what, pray. Pray at least twice a day. And when Jesus returns, he'll find you doing what it is that you're, you're supposed to be doing. He will say, you have abided in my love. Well done, my good and faithless servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. And there you'll be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. And that is the goal of every Christian. Well, happy Resurrection Sunday. The Lord bless you richly. The Lord bless you and keep you. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.